Thank you very much. And Richard's uh, getting some water, so he'll be up in a moment. Um, well, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I hope that you are enjoying your uh, convention, and for those who are on a pre-tour, that's uh, excellent as well. Uh, we are looking forward to, to talking to you and passing on some information about Canadian agriculture, and I'm sure that, uh, as well, uh, Richard will be talking about uh, the dairy industry and supply management, Jay, about the, uh, uh, the whole input supply business in the country, so I'm going to try and stay away from those things for my few remarks. Uh, as well, you can see from looking at the agenda, uh, we have a, a session from uh, sort of the various regions uh, of the country from uh, farm writers uh, from those areas. So again, I will leave most of that uh, for them. Uh, and as well, we had uh, the parliamentary assistant talking about some of the trade issues in relationship to Canada, so I'll leave that one alone. So there really isn't much left to talk about uh, that, uh, without repeat, re repeating myself. Anyway, uh, I have had a, a very long uh, career in, uh, in farm politics. Uh, my view is very simple as a farmer, um, which I started in 1979. I've been a pilot in the military before that in the Canadian Forces and uh, instructed uh, people how to fly airplanes, etc. cetera. Um, but when I started farming in 79, bought uh, Father's Farm, it was very clear to me at the beginning, production is part of the agriculture business and good farm policy is the other part of agriculture business. And I think in particular yourselves, many of the people in the room who are from various parts of the world, will understand that a lot more acutely than maybe we uh, will as Canadian farmers. Because I think, quite frankly, uh, we have taken our history uh, a little bit probably for granted a bit in Canada and we need to remind ourselves. We come from a history of a very, very, very strong cooperative movement uh, and I would say that probably because uh, the land was settled uh, in a fairly recent past uh, with individuals who had very little resources. The cold climate uh, gives you a wonderful survival instinct. Uh, you either cooperate or you die. So you get rid of the ones who do not believe in the co-op spirit early on in the movement because they're out in the snowbank and they froze to death in Saskatchewan and you find them next spring as a lesson to those who don't want to cooperate. Uh, and so we had a very, very strong agriculture and rural movement from electrification, from building the roads, from building uh, the, uh, uh, the electrical services in the rural area. There's still a strong movement in provinces like Alberta, which is a bit of a an oxymoron. It's about the most right-wing province you can find, uh, right of Attila the Hun almost, in some people's view, and, yeah, and some very proud and still not far enough right yet, and they've started a new political party to move them that last step over. Uh, and then, yet, it's probably the, the province that has got the largest number of active rural and agriculture co-ops. Uh, you know, from union gas delivery systems in rural area to electrification to internet services, it still is a very, very vibrant. So it's been able to match, as in most provinces, this kind of model of free enterprise and cooperative commodity social movement uh, and get that balance right. And it varies a bit back and forth. We also, as a country, I'm going to give you a few facts and figures, but I mean, all of those are going to be available on the website, so I don't want to run down too many of them. But we also are a country that has got very, very, very strong commodity and general farm organizations. Uh, again, right from the beginning, uh, we organized ourselves um, very, very uh, extensively. Uh, I know there are some townships, uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with the term, every country pretty much has them of municipal uh, sort of associations at the, the local level. Uh, we have some townships still in this province of Ontario that have got a federation for every road in that township that then organizes them into a township federation that organizes themselves into a county that then would belong to the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, which would belong to the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, which would be an active player at the International Federation of Agriculture. And we even have commodity associations almost that organized, from the dairy to the pork to the beef to, and very self-regulated. We all pay checkoffs, so they're basically self-financed by the farmer themselves. And if they're not involved in marketing, then they'll be involved in education, they'll be involved in lobbying uh, on behalf of that commodity organization for things like pesticide regulations, uh, for things like, uh, you know, government policy, etc. So we're very, very engaged in the political side 
uh, of things. Uh, we often say that uh, in, because we live longer now, uh, the father needs a second job so that the children can take over the farm. And so we've created farm politics for the parents. Uh, so that when they're 45 and the kid wants them off the farm, they can become a leader of something. And I mean, there's a lot of 45 year olds, so we need a lot of somethings. Uh, so, so we've been very, very involved. Uh, and, and I think that that has really created a very unique balance between government and the individual farmer and their association. When it's working well, it is a very, very effective machine, quite frankly. Uh, and we, uh, we have a very interesting mix and a great deal of commitment. I remember one time when I was over at the European Union uh, uh, speaking with the farm leaders there, and this was some time ago when the, the uh, other uh, review was going on, CAP review, and Fischler was uh, doing a standoff. And I made a comment to a number of, of farm leaders uh, from Europe over a beer because that's where I tried to learn as much as possible because I always found that I got smarter the more beer I drank uh, versus this other antigen that beer kills brain cells. That's not true at all because I was always smarter the more I drank. Um, but I would have conversation with them saying, you know, you have for many, many years kind of let Parliament and let government come forward with what they wanted, and if you didn't like it, you said no, and it didn't happen. And that clarity, I think, was a real change in the tide where they were not able to back Fischler down and the other agriculture ministers on a major reform to the policy. And for some of them, it was a bit disarming because they had been so strong and so powerful uh, in dictating national and, and common policy that it was a bit new to them to get their hands dirty and, and get into, well, how are we going to find our way out of this? And I think that there's still a lot of that kind of aggressive thinking having to take place in European farm organizations. And my experience in traveling around the world as IFAP president, being in about 65 countries, I think that that lack of engagement exists in a lot of farm organizations in, in other countries as well. And it's something that I think that farm leaders and farm writers, quite frankly, uh, can do a lot to foster. Now, something about Canadian agriculture. I actually made a couple of notes, <laughs> just in case I ran out of things to bullshit about. But anyway, uh, <laughs> here we are. All right, so Canadian agriculture. It's about a $100 billion industry, the agri-food industry in, uh, in this uh, country. It's not the biggest, uh, but as anybody who's traveled Canada at all knows that we've got a lot of territory that's not much good for anything, other than it's got a lot of clear water. Uh, you know, for that lady from Saskatchewan, it just galls me to think that anybody come to Ontario with Wascana Creek. Wascana Creek runs through Regina, in the, the, the capital of Saskatchewan. This thing is an open sewer, and, and it just got an environmental report last week to say this thing is not fit for anything. I mean, it's not even good for irrigation water, and she has the gall to come into this pristine, beautiful province and give a shit about her water. Anyway, <laughs> now there was something that's not in our water. Maybe theirs. Okay, so the agri-food industry in Canada, it's, uh, it's about a $100 billion business, 8% of GDP, we're growing slower than the rest of the economy, uh, though very clearly. Uh, the, uh, the growth in the primary industry is at about 1.3% a year. Agri-food industry, uh, the processing side, is growing at close to 5% a year. Uh, but uh, where real growth in Canada is around 3, we're in about the 2.3. So we're, we're clearly not keeping up from a GDP point of view. Uh, but I think doing quite well considering the climate and the limited amount of resources we have in the country. Uh, we employ one in eight is in the agribusiness, uh, but obviously a great huge percentage of that is in your food service sector. Uh, we try and everybody tries to lump the numbers up as big as you can for lobbying purposes. Eh? I mean, when you add the total up with all the percentages that everybody has in their, in their sector, it's just impossible. The math works about 7,000% because there's no damn way there's that, anyway, uh, that many people around. So, in provinces like Saskatchewan and Prince Edward Island, agriculture is still the biggest sector from an employment point of view in the agri-food industry, but in, in others it's, it's shrinking. $35 billion in export a year, about $28 billion in import. So clearly, as uh, the Parliament system said, I mean, we're a big trading country. I mean, with the climate we have, we're obviously importing huge amounts of fruit and vegetables, uh, 
Uh, we even import a little bit of wine, but after you go to Niagara, you'll find out we need to soon stop that because, you know, I, I knew this woman in France who used to always brag about how good French wine was and how terrible Canadian wine was. And I said, you know, have you ever had a bottle of Canadian wine? And she says, no, but I know I shouldn't like it just on purpose because I'm from France. But once you taste the Canadian wine in the Niagara, you're going to find that we should uh, be growing and producing even more of that. Obviously, Canadian agriculture lives and breathes historic by our exchange rate presence of the United States. I mean, we're, they're our major buyer uh, by far. Uh, we import 61% of our imports come from the United States. So when the dollars at 65 cents to the Canadian, US dollar, we're doing very well in Canadian agriculture, generally speaking, because all the prices are coming out from meats to grains from the Chicago Board of Trade or, or, or other uh, auction houses in the US. When we're above, uh, it becomes difficult. And so we've got some sectors right now like horticulture, which is very, very sensitive to exchange rates where some of their sectors are hard pressed. We also have a much more organized agriculture. So uh, we would like to argue that we have uh, more stringent environmental standards uh, and higher layer labor standards uh, in this country uh, for workers. Um, you know, we tend to like people to uh, be legal immigrants, and so therefore they think they have rights, uh, whereas some other countries, uh, you know, that's not necessarily the case. So, so that, uh, that really has raised our cost structure, quite frankly, up. And so when you have a par dollar, we do have some struggles in some areas. And the meat sector, which was a very significant portion of Canadian agriculture uh, domestically and export, has really taken a very severe beating, a series of, uh, with BSC, uh, the labeling uh, uh, law in the United States of, uh, uh, of basically uh, segregating imports uh, uh, on, on the, the processing lines, uh, that has is, that is hurt a lot, and as I said, with the dollar. So that, that meat sector has shrunk uh, quite substantially, particularly in provinces like Ontario, hogs uh, have taken a, a real beating and farm incomes have been poor in those sectors. Beef is starting to recover a bit, but it's, uh, it's not uh, where it was a few years ago. So the growth, as you can imagine, around the world has been in the grains and oilseed sector. Those are still our biggest uh, uh, export uh, commodities, uh, big exporters of wheat uh, and, and other crops, as well as uh, canola, pulses, uh, and as well uh, fruit and vegetables. So that's, that's a big uh, part. Uh, with the briefing you're going to get from the, this afternoon session, people will talk about the regions and what are going to show the strengths because it does vary quite dramatically across the country uh, which types of uh, production are going to be the strongest. Uh, coming from Ontario, I uh, used to always like to brag that Ontario does, even though it has a very, very small uh, agriculture acreage, uh, because the whole north where I live is really Canadian Shield to a great extent, or limited uh, with the number of degree days to grow a crop. You know, I live in one of those hot spots of the world where things are going to get better with global warming, uh, <laughs> and that actually is a fact. Uh, there'll be a few dots around in North America, and I own land in one of those dots, so I'm holding on as long as I possibly can here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we'll see. I mean, I know some people are going to suffer, but in theory, we're going to be just fine where we are. But it, it's, uh, it's still a strong and vibrant agriculture. Now, because other people are going to describe the area in more detail than I, I want to take a couple of moments because this crowd, the only reason or one of the main reasons I agreed to come here to speak uh, was the role that you as international journalists have. I am appalled with the state of world agriculture and I don't mind getting on a soapbox and talk about how we can feed the rest of the world, but it's not true. We can't. And I'm not in favor of getting rid of biofuels that, that that'll solve the problem because it won't. But we have to create a much stronger agriculture in every part of the world if we're going to feed over 10 billion people in the next 40 years. And we've got to react totally different than how we are in responding to an Ethiopia or Somalia or a Sudan crisis uh, and, and pour in food aid as if somehow this is helping anybody. Uh, I've been in a lot of those spots where you see literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres that for some reason no one's planting, where technology is in one part of the country and not in the other part, where government doesn't give a damn about anything outside of the city borders and the people they can't see, where 40% of the crop spoils before post-harvest before it's consumed, and in the developed world, 40% spoils after you cook it, it goes in the dumpster. 
There are enough calories produced right now to feed the world, and we're failing on both sides, and we're letting NGOs that don't normally know what the hell they're talking about rule the roost and ag policy. And I think you have a particular responsibility of being connected around the world to blow the whistle on this, and the whistle needs to be blown. We cannot carry on like this for much longer. And I want to make one last statement on biofuels. On the last round of WTO that we completed, the biggest cry was, and my time's up, but the biggest cry around the world was get rid of the dumping from the European Union and the United States. It's destroying our market. So what did the U.S. farm leaders do? They turned their export subsidies into ethanol production subsidies. They got rid of the corn being dumped around the world. But when the price went up in 07, 08, what farm leader, other than two that I can think of from Africa, called in their farmers and said, how are we going to grow our own food now? This is the first time in the world we're not going to have to worry about dump corn coming in from the U.S. or dump wheat. We've got a market that's sustainable without subsidies that we can't afford. How are we going to grow anything? No, they're not. Mali, a few others are doing, and Malawi, a couple of bits and pieces here and there. This is the opportunity to put agriculture in the front burner to grow enough food to feed the world where the people are living. And then let countries like Canada, that are 3 and 4% of the world export market, fill in those holes where those countries cannot grow enough crop. And then we'll have a sustainable future. So I hope you enjoy this afternoon. And with that, we'll move on to our next speaker. Now, I was told not to uh, do a full introduction of each one of these speakers, as well as the ones in the second session, because you have them as part of your package, all right? So it would be just silly for me to run over all of that. Uh, but we will uh, move on to the sp first speaker is uh, Jay Bradshaw. He was at the Outdoor Farm Show, which he may be talking about uh, uh, when he starts. Uh, he uh, had three different uh, presentations there this morning, and he had the opportunity to talk to a police officer uh, from... Uh, the town of Woodstock where the farm show was, <laughs> and Guelph where he was supposed to be. And, uh, and so anyway, it's, it's, we have a lovely police force, uh, and apparently uh, they, uh, they had a wonderful conversation. So uh, Jay uh, has been president of Syngenta Canada, uh, an agri-food uh, business uh, committed to sustainable agriculture. All these guys say this, eh? I mean, I buy chemicals all the time. But I would never say that I went to a sustainable agriculture store. Uh, but anyway, um, usually I buy them so that I kill weeds and bugs and other little things, you know. Uh, but anyway, we have an excellent relationship with the agri-food uh, and the crop protection group. I think Canada probably has fostered this relationship where we have worked for years on the regulatory system, harmonizing uh, uh, those systems, working strongly to put environmental packages in place so that we do uh, deal with uh, all of the pesticide resistance problems, uh, and, and people like Jay have uh, been leaders. Judy Shaw's uh, also in the group, has been to many, many meetings over the year working with the farm community, close at hand, with government to put good product on the table for consumers and lead the charge consistently for better products. So with that, Jay, why don't you show us what you've got? Well, thanks very much, Jack, for the uh, introduction. I highly appreciate it. It's always fun to be in a room with Jack, isn't it, right? Uh, he's so passionate about agriculture, and hopefully that passion just exudes on all of us and in your writing, and you can express uh, the opinion of Jack, which I certainly concur with. So, hey, you know, just to say uh, welcome. It's a real honor for us in Canada to host you from all parts of the world. I think Owen told me we're representing 30 or 31 countries. Uh, I can't speak that many languages. I've barely mastered the English language. But for those of you who understand French, it would be a new Canada. And a special welcome to our city of Guelph. It's a wonderful city. We have an extremely well uh, cross-functional, very cooperative agricultural food network established in this entire community of Guelph, both private and public and government enterprises. It's a really hub of activity across Canada right here in the city of Guelph. And, and for many of you, I've got to say, good to see you again, because to Pierre's opening comment, Many of you stopped by the Outdoor Farm Show yesterday and listened to me speak about the local opportunities for agriculture in Canada. So really good to see you again and, and to Jack's little story that I shared with him. Yeah, I, had a, I was back at the Outdoor Farm Show this morning, so I hosted another two to 300 growers as they came through our, our facility, and I was running behind time to be here. So on Oxford Road 17, I did have a short discussion with an OPP officer who felt sorry for me given my schedule today. So uh, he, he let me go. So thank you very much. <laughs> 
this time is what he's kind of said. <laughs> anyway, back to the, the subject matter. Um, I'm going to repeat a lot of things I think you've already heard, but uh, and from maybe from a different perspective. But agriculture today is certainly at a crossroads. Everyone would probably talk about agriculture with that opening statement. But at a global level, the world's population is about six, six and a half billion people. And unfortunately, last year, I think it's the first year in the history of our planet, we declared that there's over a billion people that are hungry or starving in the world, which is outrageous given that we're all supposed to be here producing food and agriculture. But the most significant challenge, and you've heard the statistics, of course, facing us is that in terms of food production, um, is population growth. World population is estimated growing by two to three people per second, so even by the time I finish my short dialogue, there'll be another 24 or 2,500 mouths to feed in the world. And according to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, the global food output has to increase by 70% by 2050 to accommodate that population growth. And that's an incremental to what Jack was alluding to about the, the distribution of the food that we're wasting. There's an awful lot of other challenges, and I think that's why it's a very exciting time to be in agriculture that parallel not only the population growth, but the increasing dietary requirements of a growing population. Their dietary requirements are changing, and I, I think you're well educated and you often write about this as well. But a recent Goldman Sachs study predicted that by 2020, and that's not very far away, the world's middle class, and that's only people earning between, by global standards, earning between six and 30,000 Canadian dollars, that population will expand by a billion people by 2020, and it'll expand by another billion by the year 2030. Well, in China alone, the McKinsey Global Institute has predicted that uh, the middle class will grow in that country up to 76% of its population by 2025, which is going to put huge demands. So the middle class is going to expect more varied, nutritious diets with a higher protein content, a diet that we all take as uh, North Americans or Canadians for granted. Not just, they don't just want to eat rice and vegetables, they want to enjoy a little bit of protein via meat. So initially that's going to be uh, chicken, certainly, uh, poultry, that's going to be pork, but ultimately all they really want is to try a little bit of red meat. And for those of you in the livestock industry, you know the feed conversion as you move from white meat, whether it be poultry or pork to red meat, the conversion rate is not nearly as efficient. So there's a, another incremental demand on producing feed for the world, feed for our livestock so that we can feed a growing uh, population in different parts of the world that want to enjoy the middle class that we take for granted. The ratio of arable land, you've heard these stats, <clears throat> excuse me, likely as well, but it's declining by 40 to 50 percent. So while the population is increasing and the dietary expectations and the energy requirements continue to grow, you know, we possess a finite amount of arable land. There's no question about that. So just some stats, but in 1960 we had about 4.3 hectares or 10 and a half acres of arable land per person in the world. And by 2020, which again is not that far away, we're only going to have 1.8 or 4.5 acres per person. So yes, some new land will come into agricultural production in the coming years, probably in Latin or South America, but it won't be nearly enough to compensate for the land that we're losing due, during, uh, because of urbanization or climate change or even existing land erosion in arable areas. Outdated farming practices and deforestation and other man-made factors are also going to continue this erosion. So, I mean, simply put, just what I've discussed so far, we're going to have to grow a lot more with a lot less. 1.8 billion people are living with absolute water scarcity today, or will be by 2025. Um, Jack referred to water. We're very fortunate in this country. I believe we have about 12% of the global supply of fresh water in this country of Canada. But water is the staff of life, and it's going to become the key limiting resource in the years ahead, in the years coming. But solving these problems and doing it in an environmentally responsible and socially sensitive way is really the challenge all in front of us. And this is where we need another challenge, Jack's consensual one. We need to express those challenges in a broader audience. So the question is, you know, what solutions can we achieve, uh, you know, the goal of meeting all the challenges that I've outlined? press a little harder. Well, really, the, the message is there's no single solution. There's no really uh, a silver bullet. There's a mosaic of solutions. There's many tools. Many are already known to us. Many tools are already available, but for other re policy or political reasons, we're unable to use those tools. But we need them to produce enough crops on, on a lot less land. 
For example, certain crops in certain regions of the world would reach only 20% of the level of productivity that we enjoy in other parts of the world, the very, very same crops. So if we can transfer knowledge and technology and information to those areas, we can start closing the gap. So closing only half of the gap in the yield would revolutionize the relationship between agriculture and biodiversity as well and to help alleviate poverty. Because bear in mind that the world's poor themselves are small farm landowners. Investing in research, I'm just trying to skim a, a lot of varying areas here. In, investing in research is absolutely a must. I mean, research is needed to close the gap in addition to sharing global knowledge across different parts of the world. But unfortunately, we're facing a time when public research funding in agriculture has declined over the last number of decades. It's hard to recruit scientists today in agriculture. And on top of that, many extension programs that allow the research to be transferred on the farms from the public research has actually been cut to the bone, the funding. In fact, in developing countries where the need is greatest, spending on farming as a share of the total public spend in those countries has fallen by 50% in the last 25 years. And there's some figures for you on, on the overhead here, but you know, the private sector is, in, is trying to place more investment in, in research, but you notice the difference between developing and industrialized nations. So what we've accomplished here in industrialized parts of the world, including Canada and the United States, we need to start transferring to developing worlds. I think Judy Shaw, who's with me and myself at Syngenta, we see this within our global enterprise, that we're trying to put more private investment in the developing parts of the world to help alleviate the food security challenge that we're all facing. But complexity, and I'm glad Pierre alluded to this too earlier, uh, earlier in his opening comments, but, but 50 years ago, Norman Borlaug led the first Green Revolution. I think we all know about that, and we read about it, and we're quite proud of his and his team's accomplishments. But this revolution changed the way we produce food with new research, innovation, and technology allowing us to grow, grow more than we ever had before at that time. And he won a Nobel Prize, as his team did, for his efforts, rightly so, and he's uh, rightly so accredited for saving the lives of millions of people through the Green Revolution. But today we see the issues on an even more complex manner than they were at the time that Norman Borlaug did his work. In addition to uh, increasing productivity, we must all factor in a broad array of considerations. Certainly the poverty reduction, because there's over three to 400 million subsistence farmers in this world. The use of fossil fuels, or the not the use of fossil fuels. Soil protection, climate change adaptation might be good for Jack's farm, but there's gonna be challenges for other farmers in this world. Uh, waterway management, water use, and certainly habitat protection. Those are all considerations now in modern day today's agriculture, and those are just to name a very few. So often journalists, not the agricultural journalists, but journalists in general, they find it easy to overlook the complexity of food production, all the issues we have to consider when we write about agriculture, when you write about uh, food production. Or to assume that there's just one system that's good, like organic, and forget that the impact of those systems on increasing demand for habitat or impact on food safety and security. So it's an holistic approach. As agricultural journalists, which you are in your own profession, we need you to better link with your counterparts in the rest of the areas of journalism. Given your greater understanding of agriculture, greater, given your greater understanding of the complexity and the modern day issues of agriculture, you can better reflect the complexities of food security and I think other journalists outside the agricultural sector uh, need your help. And your commitment to continued learning, certainly like an event like this, will allow you to continue to, to deep diver in the world of sustainable agriculture. It's the hardest part, Andrew, is moving the slide ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. There we go, that's good. You know, for our part at Syngenta, yes, we're in the pesticide uh, business, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. We're in the germplasm business. We're in the seed business. We're in the trait business, all of that. But for our part, as I said, we develop seeds and crop protection uh, tools to help Plants reach their full potential in the presence of disease and pests and climate stresses, while at the same time minimizing the impact to the best of our ability on agriculture and the environment. Recognizing the complexity of these issues facing agriculture, there's four key areas that we focus on at Syngenta, and Judy's a big help with these efforts in Canada. The four areas that we focus on in sustainable agriculture is land use, biodiversity, water, and access to technology. So Syngenta is devoted to building new technologies, new improvements and new innovations, and introducing those to the marketplace throughout the world. 
And we have a significant research program. We spend about $2 million a day somewhere in the world. And last year, we spent over a billion dollars in private research in different parts of the world. Producing more food, feed, fuel, and fiber, we've all heard the, uh, all the Fs, however, must be done sustainably with a finite amount of land that we have, arable land, and water resources that are available. And, but trying to produce more food without exploiting our natural resources is really a challenge, and we're very fortunate in this country. So although Canada is rich with natural resources, applied science is absolutely essential to make the best possible use of the resources in a sustainable way. This will help our producers get the highest yield from every single field that they farm in this country, while ensuring that future generations can do exactly the same thing. And we aim at Syngenta to help the growers do exactly what they need to do, grow a lot more with a lot less. I want to talk about a specific crop, though, because it's in the media a lot. It's, I think you've read about it, you write about it, and that, of course, is wheat. And it's an extremely important crop globally, and it's certainly a very important one in this country of Canada. But wheat is a classic example of a crop where we're going to need to grow a lot more with a lot less. Figures from the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, or CIMIT is the acronym in Spanish, uh, show that wheat demand is growing by 1.5% per year, while the annual production is increasing by only 0.9%, so we're going to have higher demand and lower supply on exactly the same acres. So wheat is a huge opportunity. Technology will uh, be key to bringing wheat supply back into equilibrium um, with the demand. And at Syngenta, locally here in Canada, but also globally, our strategy for wheat is to transform wheat production, being the third largest or most important crop in the world, but to transform wheat production worldwide by creating new technology platforms that set unprecedented standards for yield, quality, and sustainability. We've done so in this country with many of our crops, corn, soybeans, and certainly our Canadian story is around canola. We clearly think that we need to do that with wheat. There we go. That's okay. Thank you. So we call it, again, sticking to wheat, we call it uh, yield plus, and we think this is an appropriate approach to, the, to, to wheat. So we call it yield plus profitability, taking the business mindset, including consistency, simplicity, and scalability into consideration. Uh, yield plus efficiency to help farmers get the most output they possibly can by minimizing their input and with better use of water and nutrients. We call it yield plus quality because our cereal breeders are working to overcome today's yield and quality trade-offs and benefits to get varieties registered in this country but also in other parts of the world. And really important, um, yield plus safety to help ensure sustainability and the safety of our wheat grain from the supplier being the farmer all the way through the entire value chain. And finally, yield plus sustainability, and to do this in a responsible way that will allow future generations to enjoy the, to enjoy the same success that our farmers do today in Canada. Last, whoop, I'll have to go back. Now it's working really well. Innovation, technology, and leadership is really important, and I'm glad that uh, Pierre alluded to this earlier, but part of achieving these goals involves partnerships, and I think that's a real lesson and message I convey as I cross the country. It's all about partnerships. It's about public and private partnerships. It's partnerships with governments. It's partners with my, my competitors in this country and around the world. But one partnership we're extremely excited about at Syngenta, a global partnership, is with CIMIT, the International Maize and Wheat Centre. So our most recent one entails a joint research and development in the areas of native and GM traits, hybrid wheat, and the combination of seeds and crop protection to accelerate plant yield performance. As far as I know and read, it's one of those really good examples of a global public and private partnership. And through our Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture, we also are proud to support CIMIT's work to identify and map genetic markers in wheat for use in resistance breeding against what Pierre alluded to earlier, UG99 stem rust. It's a huge problem. Because of the very, very serious threat of this disease poses the world's third most important crop being wheat, CIMIT's UG99 research is also being supported by some of the world's most influential and agriculturally focused funders, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the Borlaug Global Rust Initiative. Another one that I want to talk to you about is uh, biofortification, another area that we're putting a lot of concerted effort with uh, the Global Sustainable Foundation at Syngenta. But one of the most effective ways to tackle malnutrition that we talked about earlier is to breed crops to have a higher nutrient content 
particularly of the micronutrients, such as iron, zinc, and in this case, especially a vitamin A. You might have heard about golden rice, which was a Syngenta discovery, uh, genetically transferring from a daffodil plant the vitamin A gene into uh, rice to become golden rice. But here's some other examples. Perhaps our best example, our most recent example, is what we call orange flesh sweet potatoes. The Syngenta Foundation supports the Harvest Plus Challenge program to improve global nutrition. So from 2007 throughout 2009, Harvest Plus distributed orange sweet potatoes richer in vitamin A to more than 24,000 households in two countries in Africa. In Mozambique, 75% of the project households adopted the variety and the adoption in Uganda was better than 65%. So as a result, and those are the results on the screen for you, total vitamin A intake increased, especially among children and women, and notably for children aged six months to 35 months, the orange flesh sweet potato contributed 78% of the total vitamin A intake in Mozambique and 58% of that intake in Uganda. So in the long run, it could save the RA site because uh, young children and nursing mothers have to have access to vitamin A to prevent blindness in, in their children. So individual programs like the work of Harvest Plus under our Syngenta Global Foundation, they give hope for achieving real outcomes, real, tac uh, real programs and outcomes that make a, uh, a difference in people's lives. However, the debate over food policy, which Jack touched on, moves far beyond just one program. It touches on markets for agricultural commodities, the reserves, the labeling, consumer choices, amongst many, many other issues and challenges. It also has many uh, experts engaged, including doctors and lawyers and nutritionists and government policymakers. But shockingly, and here's an opportunity, especially for this audience, some of the, the, the least consulted groups amongst these issues are actually the most likely to have an answer and most have the biggest impact, impact. and that's our farmers, it's our growers. We need to consider the grower uh, consideration and input throughout all of this. So finally, in conclusion, you know, it's an incredible moment in the time of history of food production. Uh, we've never had so much technology available to us and so much knowledge to work with, and we have never had so much on the line at the very same time for food security and actually fuel security in the United States. So as I've said before, we can either put our heads in the sand, especially in this country, and hope that other people in the areas can fix their own problems, or we can take this opportunity to feed a hungry world and hungry planet and minimize the footprint of agriculture at the very same time. And I truly believe not only the province of Ontario, but Canada can play a huge, huge role in that. So quite simply, we're going to have to do a lot more with a lot less. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jay, for that excellent presentation. Uh, we're going to hold questions of the two speakers uh, until after uh, Richard has uh, spoken. A uh, brief introduction of uh, uh, Richard as well, his, uh, his uh, dossiers in the program. Uh, been at uh, Executive Director at Dairy Farmers of Canada for a number of years, and uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, Richard has been really involved in the change of the industry uh, uh, for, for three and a half decades, uh, been a very, very active spokesperson on behalf of the dairy industry and supply management, and not only doing that within Canada, he's also uh, played a very strong role internationally, uh, is currently the, the president of the dairy, uh, International Dairy Federation, uh, and has been involved in numerous committees within uh, uh, IFAP, the International Federation of Agriculture Producers, before, and the dairy committee there, so has traveled uh, extensively within Canada and around the world. So, Richard, thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, I was hoping that Andrew would not reset the clock since Jay talked uh, <laughs> four minutes less than he could have. I could have used it. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Um, uh, in this presentation, what I'd like to do is uh, tell you about supply management. You might have heard about it. I'll tell you a little bit more about our organization, how we're structured, um, a bit about the dairy sector in this country. Uh, but most of the presentation will be about supply management, uh, our quota system in dairy, and hopefully some of you may have some misconceptions about what it is. Uh, I'll be able to clarify that. If not, you have to come and see me at the coffee break and I'll redo the whole presentation again. Um, et ceux qui parlent français, ça me fera plaisir uh, si vous avez des questions uh, aussi de vous voir uh, lors du, uh, de la nutrition du break pour uh, pouvoir vous l'expliquer. 
So moving right away, um, Dairy Farms of Canada is uh, basically uh, the voice of Canadian dairy farmers. So we represent milk producers, financed by milk producers. We're a nonprofit organization, and as a federation, we regroup 10 provincial producer marketing boards, as well as farmers, dairy farmers associations. All our farmers in this country have a quota, which I will explain very briefly. I won't get into too much detail, but I will try to give you an idea of how we work. Um, we also have the genetic side, the breed association through the Canadian Dairy Network. All our board of members are elected dairy producers, and we are financed through either membership or uh, checkoff, um, approved by producers, and we have an annual budget of about $75 million. We're structured as an organization in different, uh, different activities. We have about 70 uh, employees, 75 employees. Uh, we do a lot of the marketing, national marketing, so promotion on television and marketing programs. We do nutrition education in schools. We do school milk programs. Um, uh, we also have uh, policy and strategic planning, which is the lobby side uh, of the organization in Ottawa. Uh, we do government relations and communication, which is also part of the lobby, as well as internal and external communications. Uh, we have a department for international trade, mostly dealing with trade negotiations, such as the World Trade Organization or the CETA, the right now, which is popular here about the European and Canada trade uh, uh, agreement, uh, as well as the operations. We're involved in a number of programs, which I won't go through the whole list, but uh, such as uh, uh, on-farm uh, health programs, food safety program, uh, which we call Canadian Quality Milk. We do a $12 million research programs as well, both in nutrition uh, as well as um, uh, in, in environment. We have environmental programs uh, and so on. Whoops, and so on. Everybody's been talking about Canada and where we are and so on. Um, we're a big country, 9.2 million square kilometers. That's huge. Um, and this is where the population, this is a bit older, we're about 36 million Canadians, but the census data is not out yet. So uh, in 2006, 34 million spread across the country. Basically, two-thirds of our population are within 100 kilometers from the U.S. border. So even though we're a big country, we have a fairly good concentration towards the south. And probably not to your surprise, we have a bit less than a million cows, and they're pretty much where the population is. But we do have cows in all provinces, so there is a milk production uh, in all part of the country with high concentration in Quebec and Ontario and central Canada, which is also where uh, the bulk of the population is. So a bit on the economics of the dairy sector. Jack was, after what I heard from Jack, I wasn't sure I wanted to present this slide, but um, <laughs> we have 13,000 dairy farmers. Uh, we produce about 84 million hectoliters of milk, which is uh, representing farm sales of $6.1 billion annually. It's in Canadian dollars. We have uh, 452 processing plants, but the reality is that 15% uh, of those plants are owned by three large companies who receive 80% of all the milk. Ciputo, so Parmalat, and uh, Agrupur. So the, we have a lot of these 452 plants. Our very small cheese plants, artisanal cheese, we, we produce uh, over 500 different varieties of cheese. You'll have a chance tonight to uh, sample some of them. Um, and this is how our structure is. Um, Moving along, I didn't want to go too much into the history and all this, but I think it's important to know that we've moved from uh, relatively small farms over the years uh, with a high level of rationalization of our dairy industry. The supply management was introduced in, the, in 1970. That's where we started at the national level in any case. And uh, we've seen a decline in the rationalization of the farmers, so we're losing about 10%, and 5% during the 80s and the 90s of the farmers every year were leaving the industry and the farmer, farm were getting bigger, bigger. But we're now down to 2%. Um, in other words, the size of farms on average, which is about 76, 77 cows, milking cows, 
uh, or at a, farm, at, a, at a level or size where you basically transfer the business. You don't sell and dismantle the farm and move to something else. So we see now that a much lesser uh, rationalization because of the size of the farms that, uh, that we have uh, on average. Our cow are well known, uh, mostly Holstein, although this is an average for all breeds, um, of about 9,700 liters uh, per year. So we have very high producing cows. We, on average, employ three people. There's about three people employed on the dairy farm. In Canada, we're mostly Holstein cows, skinny and Holstein. We mostly have tie stall barns, although I would say that most of the new barns tend to move to free stalls. So uh, this number of, of, uh, is still very important, but it's uh, slowly being reduced every year. So supply management. I don't want to go too far, I'm not that old, um, but um, a little bit like Jack was saying, uh, we, we developed an industry where we had very local dairy farms having a very local dairy cooperative producing the fresh milk for the liquid market and some dairy co-op would do butter. So we had a two system. We had the fresh milk, very local fresh milk for drinking and what we refer to as the industrial milk, which is not a real nice term, but basically milk that would be processed into yogurt, butter, cheese, ice cream, and so on. And this is how the industry structure was. And the, in, in the, the farmers were then organized later on into provincial boards that had mostly jurisdiction over the fluid, the drinking market. And there was a huge price differential between the fluid market the farmers who were producing for the fluid market and the farmers who were producing for the industrial market. Huge quality difference between those two milk as well. The requirements were quite different. Interestingly enough, in the 60s, we had a, we, in the 50s and the 60s, we had a huge export market. We're a large exporter of cheddar cheese um, to the UK primarily, which we completely lost, almost completely lost, uh, for, except for a couple of thousand tons. Um, in the 1960s when the UK joined the EEC at the time. So the industry since that time was very much more focused domestically. However, we were not structured and other than the, for the fluid milk, the returns to the farmers were pretty bad in terms of the bulk of the production. In 1966, uh, the government created the Canadian Dairy Commission, which is a crown corporation, with basically the mission to organize the markets between the provinces as well as ensure that the returns of farmers would be fair. At that time, we also had a consumer subsidy, which was paid to the farmers as a direct payment, as a means of maintaining what the government, what we all refer to as the cheap food policy of the time, um, which was trying to keep the price to, to consumers relatively low. Now, our system is a quota system, and, and at least those of you in Europe, where you would know what this is, but it's quite different than the other quota system. When we introduced it in 1970, uh, the price were extremely low, and in fact, we were not self-sufficient. We had a fairly low production. We were importing quite a bit. And there was more quota, and this is just the quota was issued, not production. So in the 70s, we put a lot of quotas, an incentive for farmers to increase their production. But there was no additional income linked to it well, the only link that they had was a subsidy. So if you, the subsidy from the government was then linked to your holding of the quota if you produce the milk. And for five years, as all the provinces were joining in, we didn't really affect production very much. We were still lagging behind and we were putting more quota than needed in the system until 1975, when the government decided to have a pricing formula for industrial milk that would actually reflect the actual cost of production of efficient farmers and would index it within a five-year policy. Now, 1975 is an interesting year. Production went up in one year by 22%. One year. Now, many people will say that's impossible. It happened. And it was interesting talking, you know, listening to Jay and Jack about feeding the world. One year, 22% increase. You create a good economic environment, you'll have the food production. And that's, I'm not disagreeing with anything that was said, but that's a proof of that. 
And that's the first time that we had to cut the quota. So every producer's quota was cut by 18% in 1976 because we had created a surplus. And I'm not going to go through the rest of it, but our system is a quota to the producers that is very much linked to demand. And therefore, if demand goes up or demand goes down, the quota of the producers is adjusted automatically so that we don't overproduce. And the way the quota is adjusted is we measure demand. We deduct imports, and imports in this country, even though they're controlled, is about 7% of uh, the demand. So we, do our, we are a net importer of dairy products, even though we're under supply management. And then we decide a quality that needs to be produced. Then we have an agreement between the provinces, the provincial marketing boards, and they deal with each of the individual producers. And now in this country, each individual producer has a daily quota. He knows how much he can produce every day. There's no beginning of the year and end of the year. It's a continuous quota on a daily basis. And he has a bit of a margin on top and a bit of a margin on below. But it's a very precise system. And it changes every two months. As demand is adjusted, if there's a two months of increases or two months of decreases, it automatically triggers a changes in the quota, either up or down. Now, supply management based on three pillars. And these three pillars uh, that I will review very quickly are very much interlinked. You cannot have one without the other. One is the discipline. Production discipline is where the farmers will actually produce no more than demand and be fully responsible for any surpluses. This is not relying on government for that. So if you produce more, you're responsible for it. In exchange, you have predictable imports. You cannot have this determination of demand unless you know exactly how much imports will be there. So how much of that market you're losing towards imports so we can actually plan production properly. And the government deal is that we will have a system that will offer producers a fair return so that they can actually control production. Now we have one quality milk. So we've, we've, we've gone a long way from the, the 60s and the 70s. We have a daily quota, as I just explained. We have regional pooling since the mid-90s. In other words, uh, the, the provincial system has merged where the farmers take all the market returns within the region, the west and I'll keep it the west and the east, Ontario and east, uh, are the two pools. And the farmers get all the same return. And national markets, we're also having and moving now in discussion into a national pooling so that we don't have this west, east, west, or central Canada system. One big advantage over these years, and this is seasonality. Now, we have several months of winter. We're not a grassland-based production like you would see in New Zealand or Argentina or some other countries, obviously. And we spend a lot of efforts trying to have production year-round. We have achieved that. There's huge benefits for this. Uh, benefits at the processing level. We used to have plants that would have 100% capacity over capacity because they needed to deal with the peak. Now they can go at 90, 85, 90% capacity. Because, and that's a huge saving in terms of economies. Predictable imports. Um, now, we used to have import controls that the government just implemented. We've had that since the 40s. Uh, and in, as a result of the WTO Uruguay round, when the WTO was created in 1994, um, or 95, 94, um, we transferred everything into a tariff rate quota. About 5% of the products on market is imported tariff-free. As I said, we import about 7%. But most of our imports are tariff-free. I mean, we have this agreement with the uh, U.S. A lot of it is imported from the U.S. So it's, it's, it's quite a bit free. Um, and our over quota tariffs uh, are to discourage imports in terms of the access we've been given. Our tariff tends to be over 200% or around 200%. And uh, there's a big debate as, as to how horrible this 200%. Now, why would you need 200% tariff? And this is why. So the, the, the red line is the Canadian price plus a tariff. So if I put my 200% over my price over all these years, 
this is where I'm at. And the rest is the world price. Now the world price is going up and our price as a, as a major trend is going up, but the fluctuation is absolutely huge. And the difficulty this creates is that this high volatility, dairy being one of the most volatile agricultural products uh, on, on the world market, is that you create disruption in the marketplace, huge disruption. So we're trying to prevent being cut in in those valley uh, so that you will all of a sudden have a huge, very short term, huge amount of import that will disrupt the whole market and then try to go back to a stable system. The fair price of farmers, uh, what we do is a cost survey. So every year there is a cost of production survey, a random survey of producers, randomly selected producers, uh, and representative. And that survey established a target price. Now the target price is then used to different classes. We have a different prices for each of the products. So the provinces then establish different prices for fluid milk and yogurt and cheese and so on and negotiate that with the processing industry. And if they agree, so it's regulated. If they don't agree, they may go in front of uh, an arbitration uh, or a government uh, uh, commission. And they will resolve the issue and eventually the price is regulated so that the processors for each production or product will pay the same price. Now, the one thing that we're very proud about, and I think stability is the issue here. It's not about free trade and not free trade. It's about being in a very volatile environment and trying to create a stability so that the investment at the farm level, at the industry level, can actually be successful. The red line is the Canadian price over the last five years. It's, it's very uh, stable. It's going up slowly. The green one is Europe. This is the farm price. And the blue one is the U.S. As an indice, and indices, this is an, indice, an index, um, in the end, the index is higher for the European and the, and the U.S. But they've had gone through huge peaks and valleys. And this is where our system is good, is because we don't have this thing. And it creates an impact into the whole food chain, and the whole supply chain, which I will show you in a second. You're all going to ask me, many people, and I put this slide purposely, people are saying, oh yeah, but you all pass on, you don't get subsidy from the government, you don't get direct payment, the government is not investing any financial assistance in our system, but you charge it to consumers. Yes, it's true. But that doesn't mean that our consumers pay more than other consumers in other countries. Of course, now they do. We have an extremely strong dollar. And if you look in 2011, you know, there's about 25, 30% differences in price. And that's usually, you know, I'm talking to journalists here, that's usually where the journalists all jump on us. Look at that. 25% more expensive in Canada than in the U.S. for dairy products. In fact, most everything is more expensive these days in Canada than in the U.S., whether it's clothing or shoes or whatever. But we had 10 years, same system, same price stability, where we had up to 40% cheaper in Canada than in the US. Not a lot of press at that time, I can assure you. That information was there. We were not glorified in any way, shape, or form. So because of what you've seen, the, variety, the volatility in the US prices and our stability, there will be time where the price will be cheaper in the US and there will definitely be time where the price will be cheaper at consumer in Canada, and the history is there to prove it. The other thing about stability that's important is that we've seen that in Europe, actually. When you start having high volatility, when the price goes up 100%, and six months later goes down by half, you shouldn't expect your retailers to actually price in the same way as the world market goes because that makes no sense. If you sell to consumer, if you're marketing a product to consumer, you're not gonna double the price for six months and then cut it up by halfway another six months and keep doing this. So you reduce that fluctuation. You'll pass on some, but you'll reduce it. And then what you do is because you have then a higher risk, you increase your margin. And yes, we have a higher price as farmers, but we also have a higher share of the consumer dollars than most any other countries have. 
We have been maintaining about 63% of the farm returns, 63% is coming to the farmers from the retail price, from the consumer dollar. And you don't see that in other countries. Uh, and I think that's because we're stable. We increase the price only once a year when we do the adjustment based on cost changes. And the retailer now just do it, the processor do it, they all do it at the same time, and therefore we have maintained the stability of maintaining that share of the consumer dollars over all these years. And that's a very key element that is not often talked to about supply management. Why do we have still supply management? You may say, well, you guys have, are like a dinosaur or something. You know, you're, don't you get it? Globalization and free trade and all this that everybody's talking about? What the heck are you doing with marketing boards and quota system and import controls? Well, first of all, because 13,000 farmers, three buyers, that gets 80% of the milk, where's the leverage? Unless you regulate it. You have no leverage unless you regulate it. This is not economy 101 where you have an equal share of the supply chain and everybody has the same equal power. Then you have a true balance in the system. We don't have that in this, in this industry. And therefore you need to have some powers given to the farmers to be able to achieve their return. Otherwise they will be the one that will accept all the changes in the world, in the world prices will be passed on to, to producers as we've seen and they have no chance of doing it. Same concentration at the retail level. Three, three major retailers supply 65% of all the food in this country. So your leveraging in terms of negotiation is, is, is almost non-existent. There is no cost for the government. We're not spending our time with asking for money or support or stabilization payments or whatever. And I'm not blaming anybody else from doing it, but we're not there. So if you wonder why is the government still supporting it, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? Getting rid of us where it costs nothing and consumers are not complaining about the price where things are stable and there is no cost to government or taxpayers. If you don't like the price as a consumer, you just buy something else, right? To what? to disrupting the whole system, opening the border, having high fluctuation, having farmers to be subsidized some form, decoupled or otherwise. That's not a good alternative and that's exactly why there's a lot of support for it. Um, this is just statistics, I don't think uh, I'll go into this. Um, we said pretty much that. I wanted to just, this is a plug. <laughs> Go to our site, dairyfarmers.ca, easy to remember, dairyfarmers.ca, and uh, if you want more information about the historical perspective of our industry, our evolution, what it means from an economic standpoint, how it works, you'll have all kind of information on this particular site. So I welcome you to go there. Um, I, doesn't mean that, well, I'm trying to portray some really good picture, and I think we have a good story to tell. We do have challenges, there's no debate about this. And, uh, our challenges is the fact that we have limited growth. We're now a mature industry. We don't export because we're limited to our export capacity um, uh, or export very little. Um, and therefore we look at population growth and basically our estimates is we can see a growth of 1% per year. And that's the kind of level of growth that we've seen. And that's the level of growth that the quota has had over the years. Uh, and of course for companies or even farmers now that the rationalization is very small, who wants to you know, double their sizes and, and so on, if another farmer is not leaving, you're limited in having that growth and that puts pressure on the system. The same for the processing industry. It's so concentrated now with three big players that there's not a huge amount of investment because of lack of growth and therefore most of our players or, or our three large companies are investing in other countries as a means of you know, exporting or, or having growth in terms of their exercise, although they're making most of their profits here. We have a diverse Canadian population, um, and therefore you know, there's also the ethnic issue that, that comes in, a lot of Asians, they don't, so we have a lot of, po of uh, promotion to do in terms of uh, the different food habits for dairy products in particular, and that's a challenge that we're trying to meet. 
And trade liberalization, of course, all these trade negotiations, uh, although we've been successful in protecting supply management, or our government has been successful, is always a huge challenge that, that uh, basically uh, uh, the industry has to face and, and continue to fight for or against, depending which way you look at it. Um, and that's always something we put a lot of efforts year after year. The WTO ne negotiation, I'm seeing my time is almost up, so I'll go very quickly. Um, we're not in favor, we're not against the dual round, but we're not in favor of what the dual round basically pr proposed. For the same reason you see, I mean, you cut the over quota by 23%, all it will do is reduce the returns to the farmers. Because you will pass on every time you will have instability. It won't increase trade whatsoever. Because you will adjust the price down. And therefore, you'll have no more access. You can give access, 6%, and that's fine, over a period of time, which is probably you know, a bit faster than the type of growth, of new growth that we see as an industry. But the trade is going to be in a lower income market. So you will increase trade in a market that will be depreciated because you reduce the tariffs. We don't see this as a win-win for everybody. And we don't see the purposes, particularly since our consumers are not complaining about the situation whatsoever. For us, though, it means that if this round was to be completed with a current text, our farmers could lose a billion dollars in income, which is 20% of their income right now. So if there's a lot of efforts, and you keep hearing in the WTO and all these trade negotiations how Canada is always talking about supply management, there's a reality behind this as well. Um, I run out of time, so I'll skip that. I'll just finish with this. Uh, I have three of my uh, staff, much better looking than I am, um, that are here with you all week. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, uh, please do not hesitate. They are very familiar with our system. They will be more than happy to help you and give you any information you want uh, or statistics or whatever. And I uh, welcome you to be in contact with them, they'll be pleased to help you in any way. Thank you very much. And again. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, we have 10 or 15. Okay, we have uh, 15 minutes for questions. We have three floor mics. Uh, we have uh, two mics here. I'm sure that the uh, technical people are helping us out. Uh, so anyone who would uh, like to ask a question uh, of either Jay or uh, Richard, would you please just move to the microphone, uh, please, and uh, prefer the question in English if, or French, if possible? <laughs> um, in the last few days, I've interviewed quite a few Irish farmers and Dutch farmers who have moved here from their homelands, and they're complaining about the quota board that's full of old, foggy people who don't understand youth, the need for youth expansion, it's uh, regulation let them do this. And they called the board quite a few different names, so I just want your perspective on how I tell farmers back home why they should come here. Okay. Um, well, I would call them all phobies, but uh, the, the dairy industry, interestingly enough, if you look at the average age of dairy farmers, is, is probably one of the youngest industry, uh, I think the average age is about 48, 48 years old, as I recall. So uh, if you look at other industry, you know, the grain industry and so on, you'll be over 60 or 56 or close to 60 and so on. So, um, so it's all in question of perspective. I think I would try to explain the situation a little bit. We, we have a situation where for new entrants, for younger generation that want to have large expansion, is that the quarter is linked to a mature market. And of course, if everybody produces, the price is good, but it's good because you limit production. And if you, if you let everything go up, then the price will go down. So, I mean, it, it's, it's an issue that the young farmers are having a situation. There's not enough old farmers leaving. They pass it on to their son and so on. But they cannot have the set level of expansion that we've seen maybe in the 70s and the 60s when the farms were about, you know, 35 cows and, and you kind of could easily double. That's the difficulty. That's one of the challenges that we're having. Um, uh, what the provinces have introduced is uh, what we call a new entrant programs. So that they put on, on the sales of quota, we have an exchange. The quota is sold freely 
on an exchange, just like a stock exchange. Uh, and there's bids and demands and so on. There's usually more demand than, than sales, unfortunately. Um, but what the boards are doing provincially is they retain a certain percentage of that being offered and put it into a new entrant program. So every year you'll have you know, four or five producers, young farmers that will give, be given a very small amount of quota, I mean, but, but you know, maybe a few cows to start in the system. But that's really all they can do, uh, again, without penalizing the type of growth that the others will. And we're a lot of a, you know, like we, we gain about productivity of about 2% per generation of cows and we only have 1% growth in the market. So automatically, if you want to keep your size of herd, you're gonna go and buy more quota. And that's where the pressure in the system is. So we're now working very hard at how we can improve and grow the market. Um, and that's one of the challenges, and everybody's working on this. I can tell you all 10 provinces are very active in looking at how to, because the farmers are investing $110 million into promotion and advertising, generic promotion and advertising, which is a huge investment uh, from, from a farmer's association. Uh, and they're trying to see how they can leverage this to actually do even a better job uh, in trying to grow that market so we can relieve some of that pressure from the young, from the young generation. Thank you, Richard. Yes, ma'am. And uh, whoever else, uh, just come to the microphone uh, if you want. Yes. Um, this question is for Mr. Doyle, too. What I don't understand is the export uh, part of this and why it is so limited. When I was, um, I was talking to an extremely passionate Cuban man who said that if it wasn't for the Montreal dairy producers, all the Cuban children would either be starving to death or at least have significant calcium problems. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that Canada exported milk to Cuba. Um, and so this may be a big reach here, because I don't understand the export okay. part of this, is that if what Mr. Bradshaw and Mr. Wilkinson were saying about how we need, feed, need to feed the world, is there not an export element here that needs to be developed for dairy? Just okay. Just theorizing. Yeah. <laughs> um, the problem is that we lost a WTO panel on export. And because the world, when the world market is lower than your domestic market, uh, in our case, it was considered that we had a subsidy. And therefore, we're limited by the WTO to the amount of subsidies that we had historically before we knew it was a subsidy. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> the problem is that they haven't changed the number of 1986 when they told us we had, that was the benchmark. So right now what we do is we, can we, we have to limit the export. Uh, so we have very little export. And, and to be quite frank, it's, it's in the debate we were just having, it's a bit of a shame because we sell skim milk powder to the feed industry at something like you know, 40 cents a kilo. Yeah. So uh, it's ridiculous. It applies to us, it doesn't apply to others. That's the worst part, but uh, yeah. Okay, uh, just a second, sir, with here and then you. Okay, go, go ahead. Richard, could you say a few words about the costs for uh, trading quota and whether is, it is a problem for young farmers to get into the system if they don't have the quota from the parents? Oh yeah, it is. Um, uh, the quota is by province. The, the Ontario, Quebec, and, and the East uh, have now placed a, a, a quota uh, cap. So the, mac the maximum quota is $25,000 per kilo per day of butterfat. We, we work on the quota on a butterfat basis. So it, you allow you to produce one kilo, that's about one cow, roughly. Okay, so if, if you want a rule of thumb. Um, so for a cow, for forever, but you know, for every day, uh, you'll pay $25,000 to be able to produce that kilo of butterfat. Uh, in the West, it's a little bit different, uh, but the price will range, you know, from let's say 20 to 26, or in that range, or 27. Um, the demand is different in those particular provinces. So, as I said, the, the young farmers um, are dependent in trying to get into business. By it's not just the young farmers; it's like okay. it's a supply management system. So, I mean, you have a you have a pie. And people have a certain pieces of pie and a whole bunch of other people would like more pieces, but there's no more pieces. So unless somebody sliced their pieces and gave it to you, 
You know, I, so, so the reality, and, and if you look at franchises, if you want to buy a McDonald's franchise for a million dollars, um, I use this example, um, you can do it if you have the million dollars, and very few 25-year-olds have a, a million dollars to buy a, a McDonald's franchise, but want it, then you have no competition because you're guaranteed to, you know, but not everybody can buy a McDonald's franchise as much as we know that, that we could all make money doing it. And I don't want to, un, you know, underestimate the issue, but it's a system that you cannot just have a free flow of people. Uh, the fact is, is that we do have young farmers more than any of the other commodities because it's it's something that the young farmers wants to get into because they are you know, comfortable that, that all the efforts of running a dairy farm will be worth the effort, which is not always true in all commodities. And that's why they're losing a lot more of the young farmers not interested in picking up the business because they've seen their parents with the ups and downs of the markets and more often having more difficulties than it. So again, demand and supply, demand and supply. And we, I recognize the difficulty. There is no solution to it. Sir? Um, this is a question for Jack Wilkinson. Uh, <laughs> He's a <the> moderator. <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> but you, uh, you very strongly criticized the European Union and the United States for the export subsidiaries, uh, which you say uh, dumped the prices in the developing countries. Uh, okay, go, yes. ahead with, go ahead with your question. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah uh, and I very much agree with that. But what about Canada yourself? Uh, don't you, are you the good guys who don't have any uh, export subsidiaries uh, oh. yourself? You have two questions not, there. Not are we good guys? <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then the other question, and do we have subsidies? So yeah. to answer the first question, of course we're good guys. Uh, and of, yes, we do have subsidies. First of all, I don't, you took me wrong if you said that I was criticizing the subsidies of the European Union and the United States. I'm saying that was a fundamental issue in the last round of trade negotiations was the subsidies by the European Union and the United States, which in fact the end result was a very low cost of grain being dumped in developing countries. And that was criticized and one of the driving forces for the reform of the support programs, okay? And Canada had support programs too. For example, we had an export subsidy program that moved uh, prairie grain uh, to export terminals, and that was eliminated uh, and, and paid out very quickly after we signed the WTO round, and as well a number of other protocols we signed on to reduce. The point I was trying to raise is uh, you can't have it both ways from a developing point of view. Uh, you know, there was cheap food in developing countries because it was being dumped there. But it hurt farmers in those countries very dramatically because they didn't have a stable market that was profitable for them. Uh, now we have an ethanol industry and we have criticisms from WTO that this has raised the price of food in the developing world. Yes, it has, but it also has created a profitable market for farmers in the developing world, which governments in those countries in partnership with agribusiness and farmers should be taking advantage of to really grow local produce, okay? Um, but of course, all of us sinned. It was all we did with, at the last WTO was define sinning. I mean, really it was, and then we quantified it, and then we agreed to do a little bit less of it. And, uh, and so, you know, and so, you know, the big sinners were the red guys, and the, and the little sinners were almost green, you know? And that was, anyway, yes. Hi. Um, hi. I'm, hi. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting so nervous about asking a question. There's so many people. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, I wanted to ask a question of Richard Doyle. I'm just wondering what sort of future do you think supply management realistically has with the Canadian government pushing forward with the deregulation of the wheat market and also with the Cairns Group last week where the Australian government was involved in as well, um, talking about free trade and pushing forward with reducing trade barriers. So I'm just wondering on your view on the future of supply management? Well, Canadian government, this government or others, have always been very favorable to trade. I mean, as Jack was saying, we're one of a very large trading, part, uh, trading country. Um, and they've always been very supportive of supply management. So as much as everybody sees this as a huge contradiction, um, everybody has sensitive sectors and more domestically oriented sector and more trade uh, sectors. And it's a conflict that we have to deal with on a daily basis, but we've been able to manage it for 40 years. And I, 
we suggest that we'll continue to be able to manage it. Uh, as far as the issue, people are trying to link, uh, well, the weed board, you know, and supply management is the same. Well, one, it's not the same. And, and the issue here is not, and I'm not going to play the politics of this thing. Um, as far as the farmers are concerned, uh, the dairy farmers are concerned, um, if the farmers in a commodity decide to have a marketing system, the government should allow them to have that marketing system. Our dairy farmers want to have supply and management. It works for them. We're not suggesting that it will work for pork or beef or green. It works for us. And it works for the poultry sector, and that's fine. So we're not against you know, the other sectors doing their own thing. So when we look at the grain sector in, in a number of the wheat board in four provinces, I think the issue is for them to work it out. I think it's the grain farmers that need to decide what they want and to what level that they feel they have sufficient support to maintain it and so on. Uh, as far as a conservative government, if you want to play the politics now, and I, I don't mind doing this as a lobbyist, um, uh, you know, the conservative is, government is, is basically delivering what they claim they would do. It, it, it's no news. We've known for years that they want to get rid of supply management. It's been on their, pl of the, uh, sorry, Whew, what a slip, uh, that they want to, do not quote me on that last statement. Um, <laughs> We've known for years that they, they, they've made it very clear in that platform that they want to get rid of the wheat board. And I'm not judging good or bad, but all through those years, they've also very clearly stated that they will support supply management. So that's where we're at on this point. Okay, we have more people who want to ask questions and we have time. We have the gentleman at the microphone, and then I'm going to ask the two speakers to maybe hang at the head table to uh, be caught by individuals afterwards. Sir, go ahead. You talked about the lock-up of capital with those three major processes and you know, the lack of uh, incentive for them to expand. By my rough calculations, I think you've got about $2 billion locked up in quota, cow quota. And at the very least, that's got to be a, an interest cost on the farmers. But in fact, it may be an opportunity cost on those farmers to use that money elsewhere. Would you comment on that, please? Well, I disagree very quickly to your two billion. It's always easy to say, you know, uh, uh, if I take today's price and I multiply it, but that's not what the farmers have paid. I mean, most farmers still have had free quarters from the beginning, and they've transferred it from farm to farm, but they haven't, you know, like they've bought some, but not. Uh, when we look at the dairy farmers in terms of uh, economic difficulties in this country, uh, the dairy farmers, I think, is about 6%. So, so there are some farmers that are not, you know, but compared to other commodities, or in, in fact other industrial sectors, we're doing extremely well. It is not a load of the, our farmers is not a major concern. Okay, I really would like to keep it open for questions, but I'm just the moderator, not the organizer. Uh, we are out of time. There's a 20-minute break. If anybody wishes to ask questions, I'm sure uh, these two gentlemen will hang for a second. I'm not in supply management, uh, uh, but I would like to make one closing comment before I thank them all. When you do the math on how much it costs to be an entrant into supply management, I'd like you to sit down and find out how much it costs to become a cash crop grains and oil seeds farmer with the price of land if you'd like to become an entrant. And I would hazard a cost in just about every country. It'll cost me a lot more money to get 1,000 acres, uh, which is barely enough, if you're not even close enough, to be a cash crop farmer in Ontario. In southwestern Ontario, at 15,000, between 12 to 15,000 an acre, which is what you're going to find north of here, uh, do the math and find out if it's easier to become any farmer. There's money in the industry people want to be in, and that just stands to reason. Uh, and, uh, and so that's the price we'll have to pay for the discipline. And like I say, I'm not defending, but I mean, I, I think sometimes we only tell part of the story, not all of it. I would really like to thank both of the speakers for making the time uh, to come out here and be here. Uh, I know you ended up with a, the bulk of the questions, but Richard, you probably figured that that was going to happen. Uh, some people want to kind of understand this, uh, this supply management animal. And as I said to Dutch people a long time ago, you gave us the freezing cow many years ago. We fixed it and sent it back to you. You gave us supply management. We fixed it and we want to keep it. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, have a good lunch. Thank you very much, both of you. We have a small token of our appreciation. Uh, 